Hi, so today we are on to composition. So I will pull up the slides now. Here we go. So what I first want to show you though is this general timeline that we'll add to for the history of Western art since the Renaissance. This is super generalized. And what I want you to see is where some of the words that I've been using fall onto a timeline since about 1300. We've got the Renaissance from 1300 to around 1700. Um, then some important milestones at the French Revolution, um, like realism happening around there. Um, Cubism and Futurism that we've mentioned, Dadaism and Surrealism we'll look at, Abstract Expressionism, all happening in the Modernism period. And then we've got postmodern, which is 1960 until now. So this is a really general timeline I want you to have familiarity with, and we'll see this slide added to later on. So just to reiterate the principle of design, contrast, emphasis, movement, balance, proportion and scale, rhythm and pattern, and unity and variety. So, Let's put together space and all of these principles, and we'll get at something of visual organization. And we'll first look at something called Gestalt or Gestalt theory. And this was developed in the 1920s in Germany, and it really is about how our minds work, so how we sort of connect the dots and organize what we see. It's really rooted in psychology. In the 1920s, Germany is when psychology was really kind of gaining ground. Um, psychology is a really young science still. So there's still a lot of things we obviously don't know about the mind. So Gestalt theory tries to bring a lot of that together and integrates a lot of the theories of design and how they're all interrelated and work in concert with one another. So the first of these theories, and this is, and all of these will be things that you'll notice that you are familiar with, is similarity. And that's when things look similar, we tend to see them as a group. We see this as two statues of liberty, not two isolated different pictures. They're both similar, and so we see them as part of a grouping. Things that don't look like the other things stick out from the group. And so an anomaly then is a small difference that breaks a pattern. And we saw a slide of a student work when we were talking about patterns in the principles lectures where there was an anomaly to add interest. So you can see how a lot of these are going to start to flow together and work together. See the anomaly? Here's the next one, continuation. Our eyes follow lines without actual lines to follow. So let's look at this. Let's look at that again. Real nice, real nice slide work. So you can see in the word space, we've got this star swishing through the scene. And obviously there are these black on white lines that are actually there on the L, the, all the letters. But in between the letters, there's no actual line depicted. But we are connecting the dots in our brain and we read this whole thing as one continuous line through the whole space shape. And you may initially read this as two crossing lines, but it's just as legitimate for me to say that, no, it's actually four lines all intersecting. But because of the way we initially read things, there is continuation. We read them as on top of one another, crisscrossing one another. They continue on past where they meet. And this works, of course, with all sorts of lines. Oh, that's, that's especially good. That's great slide work. Um, the dash lines at the top, that all works, and we see it as one line that has 
spots taken out of it. The line that appears to go beneath the squares feels like it's one line rather than two lines that stop and start at the square. Um, and then we've got the arced line that is dashed and bent, and it appears to be one continuous line. So closure is closely related to this, and it has more to do with space. So we will fill in shapes where proximity demands that continuation works. So you can see that this image of the panda appears to be complete and whole, even though there are no lines that make up the shapes of the head here or the back. So our brains close in these shapes, even without the full actual information there. We're just being convinced that these shapes are created within the space. Proximity. This is kind of similar to, to similarity, but then different. If things are close together, we think of them as a group. If things are not close together, we don't think of them as a group. So similar shapes grouped together appear to be part of a larger object, a larger single object. And continuation and closure are happening here as well. So the figure ground relationship, we've seen something about this before. We tend to separate out objects from their backgrounds. So we probably see this as two figures being separated out, two faces separated out from a background first. And then maybe sometimes you read that, that trick where the white has its own shape as well. Optical illusions are built around a lot of these ideas. As we've seen in a slide like this, Escher played a lot with this the figure ground relationship that we saw when we were talking earlier in our lectures. Symmetry and order. Our brains want order. We find symmetry reassuring, right? It's known, it makes sense. Asymmetry, again, as we've seen, is more dynamic. So our brains would be looking around trying to figure out why things are different. In symmetry, our brains feel like everything is settled and in its place. And when we see symmetry, we start to check it. We start to want to reassure ourselves that there is indeed symmetry happening here. And, and this one is, is a close one because as an image itself on your screen, it's not actually symmetrical. If you look on the left edge where all of the chain links end, they're different than on the right edge where all the chain links end. But overall, we see it as symmetrical. But that over analysis I just did is an example of how we might check to make sure that symmetry is there, essentially to make sure that the image is safe, it's settled. So overall, this feels settled. And then there's a little variation happening at the edges of this image. So if we pull all of these things together, we get something called Pregnon's theory. We will find recognizable objects from larger shapes. We'll see faces in clouds, for example. We try to find order and the familiar we want to see simple rather than complex images and shapes. This utilizes all of the previous gestalt theories. So we really want to see things that are recognizable that we know. So they're not scary, so to say. Here they all are. Similarity, continuation, closure, proximity, the figure ground relationship, Symmetry and order and pregnans would be wrapping them all together. Okay, so this all rolls into composition then. 
In composition is how elements are arranged for visual effect. And we can think of this in terms of the placement of things, so the positioning of objects, and the visual weight of things. So the relative size, the emphasis of objects in a work. And it's all about whether the space and the objects feel static or dynamic. And you know this again already, that static means fixed and not in motion. Dynamic means to appear active or in motion. And composition obviously happens within a defined space. And so generally, the portrait format, as you're familiar with on your phones, is the up and down. The landscape format is left to right. And generally, portrait mode feels more contained. And generally, landscape mode feels more open. So if you're taking pictures of an individual and you want to highlight the individual and you want it to appear more stable, you will use the portrait mode of your phone. If you want to take a video, however, where you're showing more action and more of a scene, you'll want to use the landscape mode, the horizontal. So this is the reason why it looks kind of funny when you see videos taken in portrait mode. They don't feel quite right. And part of that is because we want to see action. We want to see what's happening to the sides of our eyes so we can look around and see the action. And we're more used to seeing portrait mode as stable. So if we're just taking pictures of one person, we want that. If we're taking pictures of more people, so we're taking pictures of sort of the environment, we want horizontal landscape. So if you're taking a picture of groups of people, generally use landscape mode. If you're taking pictures of video, use landscape mode. If you're taking a picture of one person or just a setting of one or two people, use portrait mode. And so given that, we might say that a square is sort of a neutral chassis. Um, composition can drive this either way. So we don't have a rectangle with this sort of traditional association. We've got a square. And if you think about it, maybe, um, almost all the Renaissance works you may have seen, all the great masterworks, they're either in a portrait or a landscape dimension. So they're either horizontal or they're, they're vertical and they're rectangles where none of them are squares. So the rectangle or in the landscape or portrait mode sort of sets up your brain for what you're going to see. Whereas the square doesn't have any preconceived notions of what you're going to see. Here's the Mondrian painting again. So in a lot of ways, the square is a really good chassis for abstract work because it is more open to what the lines and shapes can drive it to be. So composition projects and reinforces meaning in a work. And let me see. OK, so I've just got this slide of this Titian painting. There's a lot going on here that may not be evident at first. Um, if you just look at the whole scene, it's divided in half. And on the left side, we see the most contrast with the woman and her relaxed state. Um, so she's emphasized with contrast of value. And she's shown as being luxurious. She's a Venus. Um, and so she's on these wavy sheets that look very comfortable. Oh, look, there's, there's Fido again, the dog, so fidelity. So she's in this, this lap of luxury. But if you look over to the right, we've got less happening in terms of dynamic contrast happening. And we've got people situated on a gridded floor. So their lives, we're told, are much more controlled. They aren't as easy. Um, 
we can see that they are the maid servants and they're doing work while the Venus is in the front um, relaxing essentially. But all of this is reinforced by the way that the elements and principles are used. And you heard all the words that I use that are from the elements and principles to describe this scene. And, and it's important to note, obviously, that it's not an exact science. Um, we've seen this one before. And here, composition was probably purposely not really considered. So this is meant to be jarring. It's not supposed to follow along with all of the sort of rules of composition. So I just, I just wanna reiterate that a work of art doesn't have to follow these compositional methods that we're talking about. A work of art can follow its own methods and its own voice, so to speak. This is very much more about composition than this slide. And many of you have probably seen this image before. So here's the three main uh, approaches to composition. You've got a traditional sort of quartering and diagonals based. We've got the rule of thirds and we've got something called rebotment. So here's the really traditional way to go about it. There's the static, not moving portrait essentially of either a person or objects positioned through cross lines. So, so essentially divisioning of the surface. Um, the emphasis is on the vertical and or the horizontal elements so an orderliness and a sense that the scene is complete. So generally more subdued. And you can notice that the subject is really well contained in the first example. And the objects in the second, they touch those cross lines. So you see what's happening is the chassis, the space has been quartered and it has been cut diagonally. And so everything falls right on those lines. And so it's all ordered in a very logical sense. Um, these, the adherence of these objects to these cross lines is what makes things feel orderly. And this, this may not be true in landscapes um, where in landscapes, the subject of the work is usually the natural phenomena or even the air itself. So just keep that in mind. Even though a landscape can feel settled, it may not follow these same static quartering rules. That, that just reiterates that this is not science. And, and when I mention emphasis, I mean that, that there are focal points on those cross lines. So a focal point is just an emphasized object or area in a work. And there can be more than one focal point in a work, as we will see. So here's a great example, and we, we saw this image when we looked at perspective, but it's also got this going on. So we've got the most important person right at the center of the composition, and that's purposeful. He's the most important person, so he needs to occupy front and center of the entire composition. And related to this then would be something we call the portrait triangle. So here you see a portrait of Frida Kahlo by herself. And if we take a look at the way she's organized, the way she's arranged, we see this triangle. So we've got a really stable base down at the bottom and the figure is generally contained within that triangle. And she is front and center. And a lot of times when we see this, we see that the nose is right at the center of where the divisioning cross lines would be. It doesn't always have to be a single person though. Um, we see it happening here, a portrait triangle in this Raphael painting. So she and, and the cherubs generally fit within a portrait triangle. Look at how that 
bottom right hand foot really anchors everything um, and keeps the weight stable. Da Vinci, a portrait triangle. Um, so this triangle sets up the subject for us to examine. So when you put somebody in a picture front and center, like a portrait, like I told you about on your phone, you are meant to consider the characteristics of that subject rather than looking for action somewhere around the scene. I just have to tell you guys, I don't, I don't like this painting really. I mean, it's, it's technically good, but I don't necessarily see all the crazy fanfare about this painting. Um, a lot of people just name it as the greatest painting without really looking at it, but I don't know, kind of whatever for me. Okay, dynamic, you guys know this word, implying movement or action. So this would be where you would put the objects off of the cross lines um, and the emphasis is on diagonals. Um, there's less orderliness and there's generally a sense that the scene is not as complete. So there's more action happening in the world. So kind of a more exciting effect. Um, and you'll also notice more so that um, objects are not centered in the image. And you'll notice more so that objects or focal points are touching the edges. Um, so the center is not emphasized. So our, our eyes are being pulled away from the center. And because of that, we're being, we're being told that there's action in the work. So like, here's an example. And if we put lines through this, the way the, the focal points and the emphasis works, we get something like this. So very different than a portrait triangle, all sorts of action and movement happening here. Definitely here. This is revenge for a rape. I don't know if we saw this scene before. Particularly brutal for at the time it was created. You know, these lines of action happening here. So next one. Rule of thirds. Composition is, is concerned with uh, making a scene look complete. Painters and photographers have long used a system called the rule of thirds. And maybe if you've gone to crop an image in your phone, you've noticed this grid in there. So the idea is that you put important things either on these lines or at the intersections of these lines. So the space is divided into nine equal parts and events should happen on these lines. So this is different than that traditional quartering first and then diagonaling of the space. So this is, this is the rule of thirds. So it would happen something like this. These would be where the prescribed focal points are, um, right where those lines cross. And then other shapes or lines or objects happening along or on these lines. So something like this follows this idea a little loosely, um, but especially on the right-hand side, you can see all of that stuff happening on the right-hand side is really packed in to that third of the whole painting. There's another one. Okay, watch this video, Rule of Thirds and the Pie Grid. Some interesting stuff happening here. And they mention in this video um, something called the golden section or the golden ratio. And this is this is a poss possible mathematical ordering of the world. <clears throat> um, it, it's where a line 
has a long segment divided by the short side equaling the whole length divided by the long segment. So you don't need to know that um, necessarily, but there's something called the Fibonacci sequence. It's similar, but maybe cleaner. Um, and it's, it, it's very close to what the rule of, or the, the golden section does. Um, and so we'll see here in a minute what the shape is created out of the golden section. But Fibonacci sequence is, is a straightforward sequence of numbers. So we've got 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. And this organization is based on adding a number plus its previous number. So 1 plus 0 equals 1, 1 plus 1 equals 2, 2 plus 1 equals 3, 3 plus 2 equals 5, and so on. So both of these, the golden section and the Fibonacci sequence are attempts to put a scientific basis behind the way the world is built. And you'll see a lot here it is, and probably you've seen this shape making before. You will see a lot of science videos or pop sci videos that try to put the golden section on everything, you know, leaves, snail shells, all of that stuff. The problem is there is huge variation in nature. So no one animal within the species or plant within a species is exactly the same. Um, it really could just be a construct of the Greeks to idealize the form, and that's where it comes from, is the Greeks. Um, I'm just not sure. You see how I didn't spend too much time? The video shows it pretty well. I just didn't spend too much time on this because there's so much emphasis on it other places, um, but I'm not sure if it's really all that valid um, because this painting has been showed as being um, a great example of the golden section. But if you look at how the arc winds down into its center, there's nothing happening really except a guy's foot right down at the center. So it doesn't seem to me that this is any particularly special focal point. Um, it's only made special by the way that these lines that are drawn on it draw our feet, draw our eyes to it. So it just doesn't, I mean, it doesn't always add up. And you'll see the golden section proposed as this ultimate theory of the way that life and the universe is organized. But it's just not, it doesn't work all the time like people say. Hence my brush through of it. Okay, rebotment is the notion that the human brain wants to see the most logical and simple shape, which is the square. And it uses these, uses squares to give ideal focal points and angles of action for rectangles based upon the squares that they make up that rectangle. So it might be something like this. We've got a rectangle and here it is. See how that's working? Let me come back to this. We've got the height of the left-hand side, and we take that height of the left-hand side and swing it down. And then it swings up, and that shows us a square. And we can do the same thing for the other side, and we get the square for the right side. And so then we've got the space divided into two squares, a right square and a left square. And then we can see how this is applied to TV sets even, and the way that films are created and where focal points on films are placed a lot of the time. So you can see these, like a standard definition TV or an iPad has the rebotments happening like that right off towards the right and left hand sides. And as we get to larger and wider and wider scenes, we can have more and more happening and it will feel right compositionally. So this is a, an example of rebotment. And this is another one where I'm not gonna give it a huge amount of credit. 
because you can see that you first create the square. So we can see that there's a bottom square created and then there's a top square created and they're mashed together like this, right? And so that's how we get all the stuff happening in the center. And then with each of those squares, you draw diagonals. So you can see how each square has been divided diagonally. And using those diagonals, you get to these cross points. You can see right on his eyeball, there's one of these diagonals meeting another diagonal. Um, and so it works there. But then on the other cross points, there's not really anything particularly special. Um, one of these diagonals runs down through his leg on the left-hand side, but then his other leg hasn't got one running through it. So Robotman is, is kind of another, I don't know, maybe pseudoscientific organizational method, um, probably with even less credence than the, the golden section um, we saw before. Um, but we see something like this, where it's arguable that a basic robotment was used. Um, I guess you could argue, though, as well, this was, this was using rule of thirds, um, just using the line on the right-hand side for the rule of thirds to happen. It, it could be based on robotment. Um, I don't know. With Monet, I would say it, it's probably based more on feel. Um, so kind of like the golden section, people will find ways to attach different theories to artwork that already exists. Um, I, I would say that someone like a Renaissance artist might more consciously try to use something like the golden section because they were trying to do things that the Greeks were doing. And so they would use that purposefully to create um, their compositions, but I really, I just don't know if an impressionist like Monet would be consciously going by this rather than going by feel. So you can see here how Robotman is being worked out. Yeah, I mean, kind of bunk. So you could just keep dividing and, you know, drawing circles from where lines intersect and keep going and going and going and going until you had the point where you could just about put a focal point anywhere you wanted. This one is probably the most convincing use of Robotman or argument for Robotman. This George Bellows painting. Um, there you can see the whole figure who's in the bright light is right on that line that goes straight up through where there would be a robotted square. Again, I mean, I look at this and I'm like, um, I mean, maybe this is on the third as well instead of, of purposefully on a square happening. So big, big message so far is that traditional quartering and rule of thirds seem to be a pretty good way of making a pretty good composition. Golden section or golden ratio and rebutment are a little less legit. I'm just thinking about it now, and I'm trying to think of examples of golden section that are really um, worthwhile. And some artists use golden section to figure out um, what the overall shape of their work is going to be. So if I was making a canvas like, like one of these behind me, I could use the golden section or Fibonacci to figure out what um, what the ratio should be between the sides. Um, but I can't 
necessarily tell if that's going to be something that looks great. So I just I just want to say that artists more often, especially since after the Renaissance, are are kind of going by what works for them and what has worked for them. Um, and and even with the Renaissance artists, um, they had a lot more tradition to what they were doing. Um, and I, I, I would just say that it, it probably is a tradition based more on what has worked in the past than on any sort of mathematics before them. Here's a video to watch on the arrangement of objects in still lives. Um, if you don't know what a still life is, it's an arrangement of objects for painting or drawing or photography. Um, and a lot of times that's used to create meaning. And, and one of the slides we'll see in a minute, we can really see how meaning was trying to be created. But sometimes it's, it's kind of setting up objects as an excuse to paint. And I don't mean that that lessens the, paint, the painting anymore. Um, it just means that maybe sometimes the subject is light and color rather than the objects themselves. So we could say that maybe the subject here, this Van Gogh painting, is, is the light and the color more so than just flowers. Like, like maybe we're not really supposed to read a lot into the fact that this is some um, flowers. Like that's not really what's important here. What's more important is the expressive brush use and the expressive use of color. Stasis and dynamism through symmetry and asymmetry. And I'll just run through this because we've looked at this before when we looked at principles. Um, static, not moving through symmetry. Dynamic, moving through asymmetry. So here are a couple symmetrical images. Um, you guys have probably seen those before, Rorschach tests, or you've done projects like that, where you splash paint onto a piece of paper and then fold it and open it and you get two mirrored halves. So interesting to note though, what may be even more stable feeling than just mirrored left and right halves would be radial symmetry. So that means where everything is equal up and down, left and right, or everything is swirling down into a point. So it fixes your gaze, right? It keeps your eyes right where they are. Like a target. Here's a Kenneth Nolan painting from the 70s, I believe. And you can see here the, the whole point is for you to be narrowed down into this glowing dot down in the center of the painting, right? There's no, there's no action happening towards the edges. It's just this all-seeing eye. It's this one important dot you're supposed to be drawn into. And a really fantastic use of this was in the Kubrick film, 2001, A Space Odyssey. HAL 9000, the computer in that movie, is an AI computer and he's got control of the entire ship that the astronauts are on. Um, and this is the only way that you know Hal. Um, he is the eye. This is the eye of the computer, the eye of the artificial intelligence. And so this eye comes to represent the character of the computer. And so we're meant to be drawn into this eye and see it as the subject, as the character. You've seen this. So tending to draw the eye towards the center after the initial gaze. So they feel settled. This, this isn't to say they don't feel like they've got any movement. They can still feel like there's movement through all these shapes. You know, there's a lot of rhythm here, a lot of jagged edges, a lot of stuff happening. But it means that the whole composition feels whole. 
right? It feels generally settled. It feels like it's a thing. Asymmetry makes our eyes move around. And so that creates action. Here's a Hans Hoffman painting. You can see our eyes don't stop on any one place. Your eyes tend to flow around this constantly. Mine do, I, I don't know. Anyhow. Awesome. Very cool. So static feels more self-contained. Dynamic feels like a slice of a larger event. So this is a, a more dynamic still life. There's a, there's a lot of eye movement happening here. And I mentioned the still lives before and kind of the relationship with meaning within themselves. Um, if we start to decipher this, um, we can see things like here's a skull representing death, but here's fruit representing life. And so we've got that dichotomy of things working here. And so the whole thing becomes about the subject matter becomes about the difference between life and death and how all those things put together kind of don't make sense with each other. Cezanne painting. Um, so there's more going on here than just a still life for the sake of showing light. It shows a lot about a color though. Um, he was famous for the way he painted fruit. Um, and so it is about color, but there's more to it than that. So having a skull in a painting is always called Memento mori, that means a reminder of death. So if we dive into this painting, it's kind of about more than just what it initially looks like. I mean, I don't know, compositionally, I mean, I guess the skull is on the rule of thirds line. I guess that kind of works out, but nothing else really does. And this, this goes to what I was saying. Um, it's not an exact science. Um, Cezanne, the Impressionist, the Expressionist, the Modernist went more by what they felt looked right. Um, and that's what's happening here. Um, Cezanne went with his gut, sort of, and that's part of the talent, um, and did his own composition. But look at this. Mirandi. This feels more static, even though it's not symmetrical. Again, the rules, not rules. Feels more static, but it's asymmetrical. But it's just a couple of jars, bottles. So what's going on here? I mean, this is one that is definitely more about the brush strokes and the color and relationship of light to dark. This isn't about some profound meaning of what that jug means on the left. It's more about the quality of the paint, the quality of light happening within the scene. Okay, another type of composition we need to cover is crystallographic composition. And this is also called all over design. And this means that the composition has many, often tons, of emphasis focal points distributed somewhat evenly across the space. And the amount of dynamism is due to the elements and principles relationships. Um, we've seen this painting, and this is another example of me coming back to paintings, coming back to more work that we've seen before talk more about it. Um, this is a great example of several of the things we've talked about before. We looked at this when we looked at rhythm, but we can see that there's no one place where the eye is drawn. There's no single or four or five focal points. There's more like 20 or 30 focal points 
And that keeps our eyes flowing around the whole scene. So that also works. And, and the trick there is getting the work to still feel active um, without getting boring. So, so keeping the work with variety without having it just turn to sludge. And so I would say that a work like this is better than a work like this. Um, and maybe that is just from our historical standpoint, because like I've said, when we saw this before, um, we're so used to seeing stuff like this now that it's just, it's commonplace. Um, I, I do think though that when we've got more structure like this, we've got more of a handle on what's happening across the whole thing. It, it feels more complete. And maybe he did mean to have this feel more open and incomplete. But, but if I was gonna buy one of these, I would definitely buy this one rather than this one. And, and why is because I think I would get kind of bored with this one. Um, there's so much happening. There are, there are just 40 focal points that I can't get a lock on anything at all. Whereas here, I've got all of that rhythm to follow, but then I've also got little points of interest kind of happening all over the place. Here, there aren't really, I mean, there are points of interest, but it just for me, it doesn't have that structure that keeps everything together. Another one with multiple focal points happening all over. Okay, watch this video, super awesome. That's all. And I will see you next time.